Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. My apologies, but I seem to be losing my internet connectivity. So we will begin our evening prayer for the second Sunday in Lent, starting on page 60 with the opening sentence for Lent. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, because we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by following his laws. Blessed be the Lord our God, by whose grace we are yet alive. Blessed be his Son, Jesus Christ, by whose rising we are set free. Blessed be the Spirit of God, in whom is our hope and our joy. Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, to offer you our worship, praise, and thanksgiving. To you belong all power and glory. You are the source of all goodness. Let our worship bear witness to your peace and saving power. Through your Spirit, may we ever rejoice in the abiding presence of our risen and ascended Lord. Amen. O gracious light, pure brightness of the ever-living Father in heaven, O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed, now as we come to the setting of the sun and our eyes behold the vesper light, we sing your praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy at all times to be praised by happy voices, O Son of God, O giver of life, and to be glorified through all the worlds. Lord, we pray to you for the forgiveness of our sins. Let us reflect on the day that has, been, has passed in a moment of silence and ask God for his assistance to help us in those areas where we fall short. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, in your compassion Forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Grant, merciful Lord, to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins, and serve you with a quiet mind, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Psalms appointed for this evening are Psalms 8, found on page 477, and Psalm 84, found on page 578. O Lord, our Governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. Out of the mouths of infants and children, your majesty is praised above the heavens. You have set up a stronghold against your adversaries to quell the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in their courses. What is man that you should be mindful of him? The son of man that you should seek him out. You have made him but little lower than the angels. You adorn him with glory and honor. You give him mastery over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen even the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever walks in the paths of the sea. O Lord our Governor, 
How exalted is your name in all the world. Psalm 84 How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has found her a house, and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young. By the side of your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, happy are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on the pilgrim's way. Those who go through the desolate valley will find it a place of springs, for the early rains have covered it with pools of water. They will climb from height to height, and the God of gods will reveal himself in Zion. Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Hearken, O God of Jacob. Behold our defender, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For one day in your courts is better than a thousand in my own room. And to stand at the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is both sun and shield. He will give grace and glory. No good thing will the Lord withhold from those who walk with integrity. O Lord of hosts, happy are they who put their trust in you. Reading from the book of Genesis written in chapter 41, beginning at verse 14. The Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was hurriedly brought out of the dungeon. When he shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not I. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile, and seven cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Then seven other cows came up after them, poor, very ugly and thin. Never have I seen such ugly ones in all the land of Egypt. The thin and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had done so for they were still as ugly as before. Then I awoke. I fell asleep a second time, and I saw in my dream seven ears of grain, full and good, growing on one stalk, and seven ears withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprouting after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. But when I told it to the magicians, there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heirs are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, as they are seven empty ears blighted by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It 
is told as I told Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. After them there will rise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine, famine will consume the land. The plenty will no longer be known in the land because of the famine that will follow, for it will be very grievous. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that, that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a man who is discerning and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to anoint overseer, appoint overseers over the land, and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming, and lay up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in cities, and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to befall the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish through famine. The proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find anyone else like this, one in whom is the Spirit of God? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Removing his signet ring from his hand, Pharaoh put it on Joseph's hand. He arrayed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in the chariot of his second in command, and they cried out in front of him, Bow the knee. Thus he sent him, set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name of Zephaniah Pania, and he gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, as his wife. Thus Joseph gained authority over the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now say the Magnificat, found on page 67. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in you, O God, my Savior. For you have looked with favor on your lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. You, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. You have mercy on those who fear you. From generation to generation, you have shown strength with your arm and scattered the proud in their conceit, casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things, and the rich you have sent away empty. You have come to the help of your servant Israel, for you have remembered your promise of mercy, the promise made to our forebears, to Abraham and his children, forever. Amen. The second reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3 beginning at verse 31. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. 
A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my and sister and mother. Again he began to teach beside the lake. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he had to get into a boat on the lake and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the lake on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he said, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our canticle for this evening is found on page 52. The Lord's Servant. He was despised, he was rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, as one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the torments he endured. While we thought he was being punished, struck by God, and brought low. He was pierced for our sins, bruised for no fault but ours. His punishment has won our peace, and by his wounds we are healed. We had all strayed like sheep, all taking our own way. But the Lord laid on him the guilt of us all. This evening, I have chosen to take, to take my message from the parable of the sower, Mark chapter 4 verses 1 to 9 the parable of the sower is one of Jesus's parables by the sea that form a large section of chapter 4 of Mark's gospel this parable is found in all three of the synoptic gospels Matthew Mark and Luke the idea of listening is key in the interpretation of the parable of the sower. Each type of soil hears the word but reacts differently. For the good soil, the verb hearing is in the present tense, suggesting that this, ans this action is something that needs to be continuous and not just a once and for all effort. The parable of the sower begins with another example of Jesus' ability to pull large crowds. The mass of humanity is now so great that he must retreat to a boat offshore to teach using parables to those amassed on the shores. The crowds on the shore could also be seen as people who were recipients of God, God's word. In short, Jesus was sowing the word to these people. Whether he would have found good soil, rocky, so rocky soil, 
or one pass. We do not know. In today's parable, Jesus tells us of a sower who walked along, scattering seed everywhere he went. Some fell on paths, some on rocky ground, and still others were among weeds and thorns. And then some fell on good soil. At first glance, one may wonder what kind of careless farmer is this sower who willy-nilly throws valuable seed all over the place in a seemingly haphazard manner. An interpretation of this scene is that it is a realistic portrayal of a farmer's difficulty and frustration in trying to grow crops in the difficult conditions of the Palestine of Jesus' day. Scattering the seeds, it is argued, precedes a ploughing of the land. The seeds fall on the path, the rocky ground, and among the thorns because of this broadcast method which is not focused on sowing. The field would then be ploughed after it had been sown with seed. The parable is said to portray a contrast between a difficult beginning and a successful end. The many obstacles that frustrate the sower's labors are only described to bring out the contrast between the challenges and the harvest, that is, assuming that the harvest is of 30, 60, or 100 fold, is the yield. The proportion of seed sown to harvest reaped that will come at the end. To worldly eyes like ours, much of this effort, much of the seed, seems wasted and is a exercise in futility, resulting in an, an apparent defeat. These days, we think that things could have been done better. Maybe but Jesus, if we notice, is full of joyful confidence. He knows that God has made a beginning, bringing with it a harvest beyond all we can imagine or conceive. In spite of every failure and setback, opposition from hopeless beginnings, God brings forth a triumphal end which he had promised. The yield of 30, 60, or 100 hardly represents the bulk yield of a single field. More than likely, that yield probably represents the crop produced by an individual plant. These numbers do not represent a great harvest. In Genesis 26, verse 12, there is talk of yield of hundreds fold given to Isaac and that is the normal blessing that comes to those who are righteous. If we cannot expect a sensational harvest, a great harvest, an outstanding harvest, what's the point? In case you didn't realize it, the sower in this parable is a synonym for God the Father who sows his grace far and wide for all the souls of the world, no matter who they are or where they are. Whether we are members of the elite, rich and powerful, or the marginalized, poor, and substance abusers, God reaches out to us all, inviting us to accept the seeds of his grace and allow them to fertilize the soil that is our hearts so that we can bear fruit for his kingdom. To strengthen us, he offers us the sacraments, especially the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist. Throughout the year, but in particular during Lent, we can also turn to the sacrament of confession and absolution to help us reconcile with God and our fellow man. 
to nurture us. God offers encounters through prayer and meditation on his word. What grows in our souls from these seeds of grace is faith. Faith is a gift from God, a divine benefit that he bestows. However, before this faith can be exercised, man must have the grace of God to move and assist him in the right direction. He must have that inner conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit, who transforms our hearts and minds and redirects our focus away from the world to God. My brothers and sisters, so what can we take from this parable as far as our rules as source of God's word in today's world? Today, many churches are making adjustments to their liturgies and services to make them more attractive, more user-friendly to a wider community. Jesus' method of proclaiming the kingdom of God should cause us to pause and question to what end are we doing this some things that become apparent with respect to our religion the sower in the parable does not prejudge or test the soil he spreads the seeds wherever and does not decide in advance whether or not the soil has potential whether it is a waste of time or not. The message is not that we should test to see what response our sending it out will garner and then massage it to get best, the best results possible. There is no concern about hitting a target. This parable should make us think about not preempting the sovereignty of God or the role of the Holy Spirit in spreading God's gospel. There is a real danger in our desire to see our church grow, and in that danger we may neglect those whom we consider a waste of effort. For example, people who are different to us in whatever way. The parable also makes a point that some seed falls in the right place to heal fruit. When sowing the word of God, how does one know what conditions are right until the sowing occurs? When dealing with humans, how long do we wait before giving up on them? Do we ever give up on our family and children? So then, why would we expect God to give up on his creation, those children whom he loves. As believers who spread God's word, we are not called to be successful, but to be faithful. As sowers, we are to aim for success, a harvest, whatever that may be. But the peril is that we may become so focused on the signs of success that we get people who come into our church who really and truly have no idea or no understanding about God but are coming to church to be entertained and thusly they will not have the well-developed roots that will anchor them through and see them through the storms of life as Anglicans we often see and hear people in other denominations boasting about how well their ministry is going and the growth of their churches and the financial gains that they are seeing. Frequently, as people often do, we judge success by numbers. Trinidadians in particular assume that the bigger it is, the better it is, and that the presence of large numbers is a sure sign of the Holy Spirit's presence. The opposite is that failure is also measured by
by numbers. And small congregations are a sign of some deficiency, maybe even the absence of the Holy Spirit in the particular church or denomination. The peril of these assumptions is that we will want to offer a diluted form of spirituality that is not truly representative of God's Word. A gospel which caters to mass appeal and fails to challenge the hearers to repent of their sins and to change their focus back to God. To be faithful sowers of the Word, we need to preach the whole gospel, including those difficult, uncomfortable portions that dismantle the deceptions with which we wrap ourselves. And let whatever happens, happen. The opposition, definitely, we know, will put up a fight. And the world is not uniformly productive. God's word will meet with opposition and disbelief. Not everyone is going to receive God's word with open arms. Sadly, many have and will reject it. We, for our part, need to have faith in God's call and promise so that we are not discouraged when our efforts do not meet with this type of success that we hope for. Opinion polls and triumphant responses, however, do not determine the truth of what we believe. We can also apply the parable to our responsibility to receive the word as good soil. Soil is unable to change its character, unless, of course, there are some additives put into it. But, in God's wisdom, humans can change their hearts. This Lent, let us become like the good soil that will provide a large harvest for our God. Let us be those who go out into the field <clears throat> and spread the seed without being concerned for what the outcome be, will be. Because the truth be told, God is the one who will determine what type of harvest will come forth. My brothers and sisters, I have said these words to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We now return to our books of common prayer and recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The suffrages. Lord, reveal your love among us, that we may know the joy of your salvation. Grant peace within and among all nations, and teach our leaders wisdom. <coughs> Pardon me. Endow your church with faithfulness, and her servants with knowledge and true godliness. Defe defend, O Lord, the rights of the poor and the oppressed 
that your justice may be known among all people. Lord, renew your spirit within us, that in us and through us your will may be done. Let us now turn to page 163 and recite the collect for the second Sunday in Lent. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We now return to page 71 of our Books of Common Prayer. Light now darkness, Lord, we pray, and in your mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O Lord, support us all day long of this troublous life, until the shades lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed. The fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, Lord, in mercy, grant us safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A collect for Sundays found on page 72. O God of peace, you have taught us that in returning and rest we shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be our strength. By the might of your Spirit, lift us, we pray, to your presence, where we may be still and know that you are God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We turn to page 84 of our Books of Common Prayer, where we shall recite the prayers on Sunday and for the presence of Christ. O God, our King, by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, on the first day of the week, you conquered sin, put death to flight, and gave us the hope of everlasting life. Redeem all our days by this victory. Forgive our sins, banish our fears, make us bold to praise you and to do your will, and steal us to wait for the consummation of your kingdom on the last great day. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The prayer for the presence of Christ. Come to us, Lord Christ, in your understanding love, when all around us seems dark and uncertain, when our faith is low and when we cannot feel you near, and we find it hard to pray. Come to us then, dear Lord, as you came to your disciples in the darkest hour of the night and let the light of your presence dispel our fears, renew our trust, and bring peace to our hearts. For your tender mercy's sake. Amen. We now turn to page 76 and recite the prayer for direction. Be with us, Lord, in all our prayers and direct our ways towards the attainment of salvation, that among the changes and chances of this mortal life, we may always be defended by your gracious help. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Prayer of Dedication, found on page 73. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all persons in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do have a pleasant evening, and may God continue to guide your steps as you go through this period of Lent.